I never really have writer's block necessarily, which I know sounds like a humble brag. You always ask your podcast guests this. It's something, it's a question that I really like. Um, and so I'm going to ask you this, this question to kick it off. Can you tell me about where you grew up and what you ate? So I grew up on Long Island, New York, Patchogue, South Shore, Suffolk County, <laughs> which is very specific if you know Long Island and you know what that's like. <laughs> um, but so I grew up with a mom who grew up on Long Island, but my grandparents on that side grew up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Um, my grandparents on my dad's side were from the Bronx and were from Mayaguez here in Puerto Rico. So I grew up with a kind of mishmash of like, even though I'm not Italian, like tons of Italian food, like tons of bagels, even though I'm not Jewish, like, like all the foods that are part of the kind of working class ethnic groups that came to New York, that moved to Long Island, those were the foods I ate. I was born in 85, so when I was really thinking about food, it was the mid 90s, the end of the 20th century. And so that's the story. It was super, super New York and super American and super like food network. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So I, I do want to establish a little bit of context and foundation for food writing. I think that's important um, here. You know, you are by far the food writer that I read the most often. You know, I'm, I'm reading you weekly. I don't, I can't think of other food writers that I'm doing that. And maybe that's my shortcoming, but certainly, you know, I, I love your work and I'm a huge fan of your writing. Generally speaking, what do you think about the work that you do every day? It's a, it's not a thing I have to put myself in a, in a certain place for, you know, I've always written since I was able to write, I was writing things down. And since I was able to be on the internet, I was on live journal, you know, I, since I've ever, forever, I've been posting or posting in a different way in a notebook or whatever, you know, I've always just been like, I got to get things out of myself. Like that's just how it is. And so it's not that taxing for me. I know for a lot of people it, it can be, and I, I, I understand that because it, it is really hard work at some times, but for me, I am very much like so, so used to it. And, but when I was starting to write professionally, it was a very different thing because I, I was just really scared of putting myself out there in a real way for, for people's judgment. Um, but I, I, you know, I've gotten over that. It, I think it's like exposure therapy. You just have to like really do it, do it, do it. And then you start to get less uncomfortable. And then, yeah, now I'm in a point where like, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. How do you deal with writer's block? I never really have writer's block necessarily, which I know sounds like a humble brag or whatever, but I like, I just, um, because I think, I think it's because I've, I've gotten to this place where I understand my own ebbs and flows. For me, the, the writer's block question is, get comfortable with not writing, um, with doing something else, especially reading, especially like watching something good that like en engages you or something bad, who cares? Um, but like get used to like doing something else because that the, the writing will be still be happening somewhere in your brain. And it's just going to like, it, you got to have it like comes, come up there. <laughs> There's a good question. I would love to start in food writing. Any ideas where to start to make a big impact or maybe some sort of strategies, big question, but what would be your advice to somebody looking to get started? I would say, um, look at the out, the, look at the publications that you like. Um, don't pitch a place that you don't like, that you don't read. Um, that's the most important thing is to, um, you know, actually have an engagement with the the actual publication and to, um, you know, know what they want, know what the kind of writing they want. And I think that's always going to be a way to, to sell the piece. I, I don't, you know, don't try and pitch a place because you think it'll sound good or something, you know, like really have an engagement with that place, especially in food writing, you know, because there are so many really good outlets coming up like Vittles from Substack or, you know, the more established Whetstone, um, you know, that are really into new and cool ideas without you necessarily having all the bylines already, you know, they they want fresher writers. And I think that um, being more engaged with publications like that will be the way, you know, you get going. How do you decide what to cover in your newsletter? And I'm, and I'm leading with this question because, you know, I feel like we're gonna get, I, I, 
if I don't leave with this, I know we're going to get the, where do you find your inspiration? Um, and I don't want to ask where do you find your inspiration, but you know, pray tell, uh, how do you, how do you decide what to cover? Sure. Well, it's always easier if there's a, like something in the news that I can respond to or like just a story that I can grasp onto that kind of guides me in a direction I've already wanted to go. Um, like preview for next Monday, I wrote about um, kind of the different ways two chefs have been treated. One's a woman, one's a man. And, and I've already written about like how we need to stop thinking of chefs as super important, but at the same time, you know, that that world is not is not here yet. And we have to consider really how how gendered still food media can be in its responses to chefs and how racist it can be and how, you know, just how it can minimize um, realities uh, of people's existence in its search for a pithy headline or something like that. So, um, and I, I got two reasons to write about this idea. One was a press release and one was a profile. And so I'm, I'm kind of grasping onto that. And that always makes my job easier. But, you know, there are some times where it's just, I want to write about something. So I just do it and I figure out where I'm going with it when it happens. In your mind, who or what are writers accountable to? You know, one thing I, I do think a lot about is this, um, like I, I know last year in particular, there's a lot coming out about, you know, this, uh, the way in which food media, food and beverage media historically is positioned or highlighted or promoted notable names in the industry, um, fetishizing big name chefs, but then not actually talking about the experience of the workers in their kitchen, um, just as sort of a, a jumping off point. But yeah, who, who are writers accountable? Who, who are you accountable to? For me, of talking about workers in the service industry, that's always been complicated because the norms in food media have been to talk to the chefs, to talk to the owners, to not talk to the workers, you know? And so it's, you know, the, overcoming those norms was really difficult. And I'm, I'm, you know, we've had such a horrifying time in the last year, but at the same time, those norms have changed and that's super important. When I was 33, I was working in a wine bar in the East Village because writing wasn't working for me. And so I, you know, I came back into food writing from like that year of bartending, really freaking upset with how people write about food because it was completely, uh, or restaurants for, and bars rather, it's just so divorced from the reality of the people working there. And so I, you know, I remember at the end of 2019 being like 2020 is going to be my year of <laughs> of writing about labor in the restaurant industry. I thought it was going to be way different and I, I didn't do as much as I would like to do about labor in service and in hospitality. But at the same time, I didn't realize it was going to like open up in this way, you know, and, and I'm grateful to that because, you know, we have to come to breaking points in order to change the ways that um, that we talk about things because um, I think I, I, I quote this Diane De Prima poem all the time, rant, which is the only war is the war against the imagination. And, and that that's what writers are here for. It's to, to kind of change the narrative and change the story that we're telling. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's how I think of what I do. And that's how I think of who I'm accountable to is anyone who reads me. Um, I want to ask a question from Atara, understanding how important it is to tell the stories of trauma, hardship, inequality and abuse. How would you like to see farmer workers or back of house employees celebrate it? So how do you think about kind of balancing trauma and joy? That's a really good question. And I think we all have to think about that, like how much we are willing to be open about um, about what has gone on in our lives, what has been traumatic in our lives and what we um, what we find joy in. You know, that's the balance of of life um, and I, I mean, I think that we would see that balance if we saw more of the actual workers' voices reflected in the media. I think, you know, right now we're seeing just the bad stuff. We're seeing this customer's not wearing a mask. We're having to, you know, play public health um, worker. And that's not fair. That's, that's really, really messed up. But I think that if when this is over and we can uh, re-engage with restaurant workers and hear about what's good. Um, I think that we need to keep ha having their voices in the conversation so that, you know, we see that balance reflected. Um, mm -hmm. I would recommend FOH pod for anyone who needs a food service worker, um, 
podcast. They're really, really funny. They're really honest. Um, they're really acerbic. And I think that, that that's a, you know, we need more of that. And we need to see like, you know, where's their profile in Bon Appetit. I hope writers are not gonna be afraid of, you know, giving voice to other people. <laughs>